So welcome everybody to the Tag Contributor Strategy uh, Maintainer Session. We're Tag Contributor Strategy, which means we're a group within the CNCF um, that helps projects be successful um, as cloud native open source projects. Um, and to do a number of things, including recruit contributors, which is something that projects are really working on. Um, and all of us are contributors to um, uh, Tag Contributor Strategy. Um, and so uh, you're going to meet everybody um, who's going to come up and speak, including Catherine and Dawn uh, and Sandeep and Ali and Rian, um, who are all going to talk about some of their areas of knowledge. And the idea is to lead you down sort of a little journey of all of the things that you do to attract and maintain contributors, including accessibility and responsiveness and advancement and activities and roadmaps and, um, and recognition. So with that, um, I want to get started with talking about accessibility with Sandeep. Hello friends, I'm very excited for my first ever speaking opportunity at KubeCon. A few seconds back, I intentionally spoke without voice, and I wonder how many of you followed what I spoke. So in the same way, unless there is accessibility in place, deaf and hard of hearing people like me cannot truly really follow the conversations. <coughs> What accessibility helps with is creating a level playing field so that each of us can contribute actively. <coughs> it helps to get your project a diverse set of contributors rather than having just a specific set of contributors. <coughs> I remember showing up at my first tag contributor strategy group meeting over Zoom. I did not know anyone. I just showed up. And a few minutes into the meeting, Josh, he asked me if, um, if the captions are working fine. So that one line, that one line, whether the captions are working fine or not, it really made me feel belong because I'm a person with hearing impairment and I rely entirely on captions and lip reading. So the sense of belonging that I felt, the sense of inclusion that I felt, made me feel so much welcome. Accessibility doesn't need a rocket science. All it needs is the spark of empathy, a bit of awareness, and willingness to include diverse set of people. <laughs> One of the most beautiful things that you could do about accessibility is to be an any or a body. And throughout my career, it is the hearing people who have acted as enablers. Like my first job, like the time when I got my first job, the time when I first time went to a client's place, or my very first speaking opportunity at KubeCon. So in the last KubeCon at Chicago, in the keynote session, I happened to sit next to Catherine, and I got talking and she introduced me to the deaf and hard of hearing working group that she just helped to found. And a few months later, she introduced me to the wonderful panelists. So you can imagine, I did not know any of them a couple of months ago, and today I'm collaborating with them and speaking here. So being an LA allyship is an incredibly powerful tool that you can use. And one point is that, People with disabilities may take some more time for the initial ramp up, but once they ramp up, they are as good as anyone else. <coughs> the second point I'd like to make is 
to make sure that your contributor guidelines talk is simple, is written in a simple, clear language without any technical jargon so that newcomers don't feel overwhelmed. Your ability to put complex phrases into simple terms demonstrates your maturity as a software engineer. <laughs> and lastly, being consistent is the key. Accessibility is not like you do it one time and forget about it. It has to be internalized. It has to be consistent. Now, when you start contributing to open source, you wonder where to begin. And the same goes for accessibility as well. Where do you begin with? And so, the graph and the heart of your working group has come up with a set of guidelines, best practices, and recommendations that you can easily incorporate to make your meetings more inclusive. <coughs> you can attend one of our meetings, and you can ask us how we can help contribute to our projects. We have set up a kiosk in the pavilion booth. You are free to drop by and say hi to my members sitting here in the front row. And today evening, we have, today evening we have a sign language crash course that is guaranteed to be fun. So please make sure you attend it. Summing up, I was saying that when you embrace accessibility, you unlock opportunities to get truly and diverse sort of contributors in your project, taking it to the next level. Thank you. Over to Ali. Thank you, Sandeep. Um, so, I talk about I will talk about being responsive to your community. So, uh, what being responsive to your community means? So, if you're running a business, for example, and if you're not replying to your customers, you'll lose those customers. So, same happens for contributors and open source projects too. Nobody wants to be part of a community which is not very interactive, interactive or people cannot get answers or helps. So this seems like a simple thing, but it's really important. To state the obvious, you're not very responsive if your PR time to merge is too long, or if you're not triaging your issues, PRs in time, if you're not responding your Slack messages, questions in time, or if you have these giant endless discussions uh, uh, for a feature request or for a bug report or whatever, for making a discussion about it, uh, ma making a decision about it. So CNCF dev stats can help with measuring some of these. It's a bit detailed topic, so I will not go into uh, details here, but uh, you'll find me around if you want to talk about CNCF dev stats and how to compare your projects with other ones. So, uh, what you need to fix in this situation, if you feel like your community is not really responding to, not, not really responsive, is you need to fix the someone else will handle it attitude, and you also need to fix your decision making. And the good thing is this is rather a low investment fix. You don't need a complicated setup, you don't need complex tooling or stuff like that but you need community awareness for this. So uh, to raise this awareness, mention this problem in your community meetings, in your emails, uh, or better yet, be a good example yourself. So for being a good example, I have a few suggestions. Uh, always acknowledge queries when someone asks your community something, uh, even if you don't know the answer. So if you don't know the answer, you can always ping the right person. Um, do a issue triaging and or PR triaging session in your community regularly. I'm pretty sure some of you do this, but there are also some projects, some communities not doing it. Employ lazy consensus for decision making. Uh, in case you don't know, this is basically saying we're going to go with this decision in two weeks, three weeks, whatever, unless there's a big objection. So we don't need to wait for approval from every single person. Um, and also uh, recognition. You need to recognize contributors 
uh, but there will be other panelists, talk, panelists talking about uh, contributor kudos, and I leave it to them. Thank you. Next is Don. Okay, so Ali just talked about responsiveness, and one way to improve responsiveness is by recruiting more people into your project and moving them into leadership roles. A contributor ladder is a really good way to help people take on increased responsibilities within their project. And, and the, as they do that, they move up the contributor ladder to reduce the load on the already overworked maintainers and other contributors. Defining the roles and responsibilities for contributors, reviewers, and maintainers can really help with recruiting new people into these roles. It can help to think about this as a ladder where contributors climb up to become reviewers, those reviewers become maintainers. And what's important is to document this ladder and make sure that people understand how they can climb the ladder and gain more responsibilities within the project. And all of this helps set expectations for the roles and encourages people to think about how they might take on increasing roles of responsibility within the project. And as you get more people moving into maintainer roles, you can reduce the load of the existing maintainers. Now, the good news is that we have a template at the bottom of the slide that you can use to avoid building this from scratch. Now, the template probably has more roles than most projects need, so it can usually be simplified and customized for what you need for your project. At a minimum, you should probably have a community participant, a contributor, and a maintainer roles, but I would also strongly encourage you to add a reviewer role since it can be a good step on the ladder to help people prepare to become a maintainer. And I would also like to see more projects have an option for people to move into emeritus roles, which recognizes the hard work that someone put into a project, while, um, and then giving others a point of contact if they have questions about what came before, while also allowing that person to step away from the day-to-day -day roles within the project. And if you're a maintainer, I really encourage you to think of stepping into an emeritus role as a way of successfully handing off your duties to the next generation of maintainers for your project. One thing I think people sometimes forget is that you can have maintainers or other leadership positions for people who are responsible for things like community management, documentation, program management, product management, and lots of other roles these people become responsible for making decisions and approving PRs in areas where those types of activities happen um, in the repository. And people working on these tasks make decisions about decisions also that might not necessarily happen in a repository. And I think too many maintainers underestimate the amount of time they spend on these activities and recruiting people into these roles can really help reduce the workload of other maintainers and project leaders. Within Tag Contributor Strategy, we also have a non-code initiative, so the link at the bottom of the slide, within our Contributor Growth Working Group, where we talk about ways to get more people involved in the CNCF and other open source projects. And with that, I will turn it over to Josh to talk more about how to actually recruit those contributors. So if, if your project is responsive and you have a bunch of contributor roles that you want to recruit, so, that you want to recruit people into um, and you know, you're ready for those additional contributors, one of the things that you will want to do is to have some contributor recruitment activities. Um, but that can be a little scary because once you start investigating contributor recruitment activities, you're like, oh, well, there's mentoring and we can do some stuff at KubeCon and we have this other stuff. We do a hack fest and we're doing participant in Hacktoberfest and that sort of thing. And it becomes a real state of option paralysis. We end up doing nothing because there's too many things to do. And the answer there is to restrict your scope of activities to the things that you can sustain. And one of the ways to do this is that we talk about um, high investment versus low investment contributor recruitment activities. So low investment contributor recruitment activities are ones where you can put in a little bit of effort 
to help attract more contributors. And often the effort is one time, right? Like something like a, a basic contributor guide, right? Is you do that and then you only update it like once a year. You don't have to continuously be active on it. Um, all right. Whereas, you know, and the idea of these low investment activities is you should do several of them because they are low investment. And eventually, as your project matures, you're going to do most of the possible low investment activities. High investment activities require a lot of maintainer time. They require a bunch of maintainer time. They require maintainer time every time you do them. And as a result, you're only going to do like maybe one or two of these, you know, maybe two of them a year or something like that, three of them a year. And that's okay. That's actually what you should plan on. Um, now, you start with the low investment activities because a lot of the high investment activities depend on the low investment activities to be successful. So let's talk about a few of these. So the first low investment one that you should be doing because the CNCF requires it is to have a basic contributor guide. Right? Now, you'll improve this contributor guide throughout the lifetime of your project, but you can get some basics in there right away. And then after that, a lot of your other low investment activities consist of other documentation, right? Which is also like a reviewing guide and, um, and a guide to communi communication channels in your project and the contributor ladder and a bunch of other things that give, you know, convenient access to potential contributors to things that they can do. Now, the, and, and the other big part of low investment is obviously maintaining your comms, is to have a few comms channels and make sure that those are staffed, as Ali talked about. Now, once you've done some of the low investment activities, you want to look at maybe doing one or two high investment activities. Now, you're here at KubeCon. Obviously, one of those is there's a whole bunch of opportunities for contributor recruitment right here at KubeCon. Now, those are obviously high investment because your project members need to make it to KubeCon in order for those to happen. But that includes things like maintainer sessions, kiosks, contrib fest, other activities. Now, you can also do those sorts of live event recruitment at other events, right? Like at a KCD, at a meetup, um, you can participate in online hackathons. Again, probably not more than one a year. These are a lot of work if you want them to be successful. Um, the other high investment things you want to look at is ongoing stuff, right? Kubernetes, because it's a really big project, we actually have a fully interactive contributor tutorial, right? And if you have the kind of resource to produce that, it's a very valuable thing to have. But it is a lot of effort both to build and to maintain. You have video programs and you can do other things that are high investment and help you contribute recruitments, but again, don't get carried away. So to sum up, you know, basically pick three, four things that you can do that are low investment, one or two things you can do that are high investment. And do this based on, these activities are largely equivalent. Do this based on what works for your project, right? What somebody already wants to do, what's convenient for their location or their schedule or their pre-existing skills, right? Um, you know, minimize your effort, maximize your impact. And with that, we're gonna talk about one sort of medium investment activity that you can do to attract contributors. Thank you, Josh. Um, so Josh talked to us about how to get contributors to your project and mostly the first point of contact would be your GitHub repo. So uh, Albert Einstein said what's obvious to you might not be obvious to others. And it's also not even obvious that he said that. So, when people go to your GitHub repo, the first thing that they see is your README. And then they might actually look at your charter. Go to your own GitHub repo, look at it as if you've never seen it before. Does the README actually tell the person what's the product about, when are we meeting, who's the leadership, basic things. Are you actually communicating that? Make sure that your README it, does what it's supposed to do. Your charter, your project is five, six years old, and then you had a charter when you started off. Are you actually still following that charter? Is it still up to date? So make sure those things are, new people look at that and say, oh yes, I can get involved, and then they get there and the charter and the project's not matching up. So make sure about things like that. GitHub repository, that is your filing system of your project. If your filing is a mess, 
Nobody can find the code. Nobody know how to contribute all the documentation that Josh referred to. Make sure it's filed in a way that is intuitive to new people. Look at it again, like you've never been there before and say, oh, this does not make sense. And just reorganize. It's low investment. Then, very important thing, when you go to your repo, you manage things through GitHub issues and PRs. If you just have a list of issues, what's important? Nobody knows. If they're not part of the in-group, they can't tell what's important. Get a GitHub project board, they are very useful. Lots of automation available. Automate as much as possible. It should not be hard work. It should actually reduce the work. Put it in columns that's suitable for your project. If it's in backlog and it can't be fixed, block it, put it somewhere. Bonus tip on the project board, labels. There's a lot of CNCF projects that does not have any labels on their project. Use labels like help wanted, good first issue. Um, you can put code, you can put information about the feature. Use the labels extensively and then there's features inside the project boards where you can filter by um, views for specific types of labels or specific, specific types of work that also makes it easier for people to find things where they can contribute. Make it easy for people to be in your project and see where they're going. Okay, so uh, we talked a lot uh, about many aspects on how to build your contrib contributor base. And the last area we're gonna touch upon uh, sounds fairly simple, but it's incredibly powerful, and that is contributor kudos. So everyone appreciates a thank you, right? We know that, and that, and a thank you goes a really long way, and that's no different in open source, right? Your contributors are donating their time to improve your technology, to help others, like on Slack maybe, um, to educate others on your um, project. Um, some may contribute to the docs, some may write a blog post, um, uh, others may um, share their journey on, at Coupon or other conferences, and all this is really critical for your project. And the least they deserve is a thank you, right? I think we can all agree on that. Um, but the interesting thing or like, is that a thank you may actually be one of the most powerful tools you have. And the good news is that anyone can do this. Uh, so be sure to include shout outs wherever possible, right? When you write an announcement blog, um, make sure you mention the contributors who helped build uh, those features um, on social media as well, on Slack, everywhere you can. That's an easy one. If you um, want to go a step further, you can build a recognition program. And um, I wanted to um, kind of show the Linkerd recognition program as an example. Um, so um, for Linkerd, maintainers and community members can nominate their Linkerd hero. And so we have three categories. We have code contributions, we have helping community members, uh, and we have spreading the Linkerd message. And the latter two are really, really important because most people think of code when they think of contribu uh, contribution, um, yeah, uh, open source contributions. Um, but your project needs all of it, right? So it's very important to also uh, rec to publicly recognize people for those uh, contributions as well. So they know that that is important as well. Um, and so we tried to make it really fun. You saw the previous graphic um, and we have here one with a hero. Um, we also create a dedicated blog post and uh, that may sound a lot like a lot of work, but we're all busy, right? So uh, we cannot really write a custom blog post for every single person. So we keep it simple, we have a template uh, with one customized section, right? And I ask whoever worked with that contributor to help me like write like one or two sentences to make it very, very personalized, right? And the rest is like very standard. So it's really easy to create these. Then every uh, person gets, uh, every hero gets a Linkerd badge, uh, Linkerd, sorry, LinkedIn badge, <laughs> typical project, uh, problem. Um, so the good, so a, Linker, a LinkedIn badge uh, is actually a CNCF uh, benefit which is really cool, so all projects can uh, use that. Um, so um, initially when we were building the um, program, we asked the CNCF if we could have one of those badges, like everyone who has spoken at KubeCon has gotten one of those, so you can get like something similar. Um, so yeah, if your project is wants to create something like that, please uh, reach out and um, you can request that for free. And then 
everyone gets on our hero wall. Um, and then, um, yeah, our community, uh, community members really, really appreciate that. Um, so I encourage everyone uh, to take contributor um, kudos really seriously, because it may seem like a small thing to you, uh, but it does show contributors that their work is appreciated. So it is, it really goes a long way. Uh, and so that's all for today. Here are a few ways to get in touch or learn more. Uh, you can join our Slack channel. You can just pop in, a, in our, uh, one of our meetings. You can participate in the maintainer circle. We have lots of resources, so uh, check those out. And one last thing, Sandeep already mentioned it. So the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Working uh, Group has a kiosk in the mornings. Uh, so we would love for you to swing by and say hi and talk to these wonderful people. Uh, and I think we're ready for Q&A. Yeah. Great. Right. So you have questions, we have ideas, um, and we have a second mic. Hi, thank you very much for all the recommendations. Um, they would work perfectly for large organizations and large projects, obviously. Um, my question is, how do you compare them for small-scale projects, small organizations, individuals, and they usually need much more contribution? How would you compare your recommendations? Thank you. I think the, the part about what does your repo look like is super important, especially um, young projects. That's often the um, GitHub repo is not a proper recruiting tool. So make your readme exciting, make your uh, where you're going with the project clear, what you're trying to achieve with the project, what, what is the, what's the problem we're busy solving? Make that clear and somebody will come and say, oh, I have this problem. And then they'll start using the thing and say, oh, I need this feature and they'll start contributing. But if it's unclear, if it's just a logo and a uh, few things you threw in there just because you opened the repo and I want the readme, um, make sure you invest time in your README and your, uh, your charter to say this is where we're going because that's the vision, that's the light, the laser for the cats to follow. If, um, yeah. yeah. And, and that was actually why I also talked about picking how much you can do in terms of activities, right? Because if you have a small project and you have one very part-time community lead, then maybe you only do one activity a year, right? But you can only handle so many new contributors anyway, so that one activity is enough in that early stage. Hi, um, I'm a somewhat newly minted maintainer for the Istio project, which is pretty large. Um, and it's my first experience as a maintainer there. <clears throat> and one of the things that I struggled with a little bit is understanding how to say no to what might be a first-time contributor in a way that makes them not want to not come back again and contribute again, right? Like sometimes they, you know, the answer is let's work on this, we can make it better. Sometimes the answer, sometimes the answer is just the community's decided this approach, we're not going to do it. So thank you, but no. How do we, what, what are some tips for saying no in a way that doesn't make people not want to come back if you have to say no? I think one of the things can, that can really help is by having um, some of that documented as much as you can. So having a really clear scope document, so what's in scope and what's out of scope for, for Istio. And that helps because then you can point people to something. You can say, hey, you know, you know, thank you for your contribution, but we've decided to go in this direction. Here's where you can find more details. Um, we'd love to have you contribute more. And so I, I think just being being really careful to be kind and empathetic in those in those responses, I think can go a long way. And maybe if you can, you know, as you're saying no to them, if you can think of something related that they might be interested to work on, maybe pointing them in another another direction that might be, you know, kind of along the lines of of their skills and their interests. One of the other things I would say is say no quickly, right? Don't ask them for just one more thing, like seven times, and then say no. That's what really drives people batty, right? And, and do give them the opportunity to participate in the discussion also, right? Is to say, hey, we're going to discuss your proposal at our next community meeting, you know, if you can be there, 
um, the and if you can't be there, then you know I'm going to have some questions for you. So that so they feel like even if they didn't get the answer they wanted, they had a chance to participate in in determining that. Uh, yeah, great presentation and a lot of useful things you can take away today, so thanks for that again. Um, I am curious about what do you all feel are the most impactful or you know, the, the activities that we can do that will have the biggest impact on the, like a large set of contributors we have in a project that are you know, doing smaller fixes and, and you know, more scoped things to getting more of those people to take that leap to you know, big epics and big designs and stuff. Like what's the most impactful things that will get people up the ladder from smaller stuff to bigger stuff? Um, I would say, I mean, one thing is obviously, actually, or you could take this, Ali. Okay, yeah, one, one thing is obviously mentoring, right? Is that to get to that big epic and that sort of thing, they're really actually going to need, and this, is, this was listed, but I didn't really talk about it in my high, my high investment activities, obviously, is to have a reviewer, an existing reviewer, maintainer, mentor them in working on that big change. And I think too, asking people for specific things. So, you know, no, noticing that someone is interested in working in a space or that they have a particular, a particular skill set in an area that you need for the project. Sometimes just asking them and it makes, it makes them feel appreciated. It makes them feel like you value their input and you know, they may or may not have the bandwidth to do it, right? But I think that, you know, just people knowing that they're appreciated helps kind of encourage them to step up in the project. And then also um, looking at your road mapping and your charter. So if you have specific needs, write them out in the issue, clearly describe, I'm looking for somebody to do these things. This is the outcome we're looking for. Stick it in the backlog and then you can add user labels and say help needed, good first issue. Or you can, if, as you say, you've got first issue people but you want them to do the advance and you can, you can kind of Everybody wants the next badge. So you say, this is next level iteration, or think about what, what would be the bait that you can hold out for somebody to say, oh, I, can, I could do that, but maybe I should pick up these and make it attractive as the next, and be clear about what you want and list them in the issues because people get there and they're unsure and they're new and they're not sure. Okay. And if they read the issues, oh, I, I got this skill. And also with your labeling, if you specifically go lang, you need rust or whatever, label it according to the to the language or the skill and yeah, that would also help. I can say yeah, I can say one last thing. So it's a generic answer, but again, invite this person to the community meeting. So people are uh, people feel more encouraged in a community meeting to take new responsibilities instead of just seeing the uh, like hundreds of issues and trying to find out which one is the best for them. Thank you. So thanks for the nice discussion. Uh, I have a small question, maybe from the language barrier, but I never heard the word charter in this context. So could you maybe explain what you exactly mean by charter? I'm So a charter, um, most of your CNCF projects have a explanation of what is the project. So if you go to the, TOC, uh, the contributor strategy um, repo, you'll see we have the charter and the charter says, this is the work that we plan to do and the vision that we have for this project, for this specific working group. And then you can also have a section that says, this is in scope, we're gonna do these things, but we're not gonna do those things. So you can say, I'm doing a storage project, and, 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 but we stop at the network level. Then we're just gonna, so by drawing a circle around your specific work is your charter making it clear to people what they're getting involved in. And also your, tra your charter is, your, the question that you ask, answer with your charter is, what's the problem we're solving? So you write out, I'm solving this problem with this project, this is how we do it, and this is how we're not doing it. And that just helps people to understand what it's about. So it's like a little bit of a marketing document as well. That, that also helps you with the whole saying no problem. Because if you have a clear charter that says what's out of scope, then you're less likely to have somebody come along 
with a piece of functionality that you just really don't want as part of your project at all. It was just a follow up. What thing that is nice for non native speaker is to record your meeting so people can catch up after for things they don't understand. And uh, for CentOS board meeting, we did that and we got a lot more engagement after the meeting because we could publish the whole board meeting in the video. And nowadays it's not too hard to do. It was not true a few years ago, but nowadays uh, with uh, Google or Zoom, whatever, it's not that hard and it helps a lot. Uh, the people that don't catch up everything during the meeting and future director. So if you can do that, in general, it helps a lot. And just a point on charters while, uh, while they pass the mic. We actually have a whole document in the governance section about how to describe your charter and what should go in it and what it should look like for, for projects, for maintainers. So my question is around um, recruiting. Can you speak up? Okay. Speak up. My question is around recruiting contributors. Um, as a, well, basically the um, CNCF as a foundation, right? Um, how should we approach, or how are we um, trying to actively recruit volunteer contributors, and what, um, how do we? basically strategize that so that we have a more diverse set of um, contributors. For. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it. He was talking about strategies for attracting a more diverse set of contributors. Okay, so I think uh, to attract more diverse set of contributors depends like what kind of diverse people are you looking for. Okay, like for example in my case, the needs of my accommodation are pretty simple. Like I just want captioning and as long as captioning works, I feel like I'm able to follow everything. So then it's like if you want to have like a hard of hearing people who are relying on caption, you just need to make sure that your meeting includes the accommodation. But then there are enough people like my friends who are sitting here, they don't rely on captions and they prefer sign language interpreters. So then if you plan to include them, you need to make sure that your meeting has some interpreters that they can follow. And then if you want to have like blind people, more blind people contributors, you need to know like if whatever your meetings or whatever strategies you are using is inclusive for them. So accommodation needs very widely and as I said, it does not need a huge investment. It's not that complex. What you just need to do is just reach out to them. Like if you see me here, yeah, you can just come and talk to me and say what are my accommodation needs. If you meet a blind person, you can just ask what accommodations do you need. And then you see if you have that, if you have that accommodation already in place, then they can very easily be a part of it. And it all starts basically from your empathy to see a human being as a human being. As long as you see a human being as a human being, you will feel the natural desire to include them. That's it. Um, and I think, of course, you don't know who wants to participate <laughs> before, um, I mean, you don't know it, right? So I think, like, as a project, just being very vocal about it uh, or, like, publishing it somewhere on your, um, on your GitHub repo or something that accommodations may be made, you know, like, can be made or to come and talk, just invite people to come over and, and, and say, we'll, we'll, we'll try, we'll figure it out if you want to join. So I think, because you, you don't really know who wants to be, you cannot guess who might be interested, right? So just letting people know that if they can't, like, like if they're interested, come and join us, tell us what you need. Because one of the important things is like, you have to ask them what they need, don't assume, right? Like a lot of people make that assumption that's like, oh, a blind person needs that, or that people, uh, that person uh, um, needs the other thing. Like ask them what they need and what what's comfortable for them. So I think like just being public about that, I think that could attract, um, at least in the accessibility uh, part, um, a lot of different people. 
Then another way for projects to, if you want to um, diversify the community that's actually contributing it, um, we have the mentoring working group underneath the tag contribute strategy. Talk to us about that. So basically it's, it's not a job offer arrangement, but it works quite similar. So the project can make a statement about work that they want done. And then they submit that to the, um, to the mentoring working group, they publish it, and there is in the LFX platform a way that people from all over the world apply for that. And if you're a project and you want to increase your diversity, you go through the applications and find people that suits your need that you try to resolve. And you can actually look at the skills, you can look at the time zone, you can look at various things, language, whatever. So if you, we're in France. So if you need French contributors, but you're in the US, then publish it and say, I need somebody that can speak French and can program in Golang. And then people with those skills will apply. And if you have a f edge case of diversity that you want to fill, just properly state it in your requirement. What? Yeah. One last thing I'll add there, right, in addition to mentoring, one last thing that I will add there um, is, uh, that we haven't mentioned before, is code of conduct. Um, that is really important. You need to make sure that the leadership in your project believes in the code of conduct um, and is willing to support it because people need to feel safe. Um, and if they don't feel safe, they won't participate. Just one more point that I'd like to add is, so like you are having a project meeting, then you can just tweet about it and then add a tag like accessibility inclusion and mention that you are looking for diverse contributors and then put that in your social media and some of your contacts, it will be retweeted and some of us see and then we get the feeling that, oh yeah, this is a, they are looking for diverse contributors and we are encouraged to be a part of it. But as Josh said, like in my talk, I said, when I joined the meeting, he just stopped for a moment and said, are oh, the captions working? So the sense of inclusion, that line, I mean, that's the way you get more diverse people. It's about just saying a line or two just to make them feel belong, make them feel welcome. Because there is, as I said, there's an initial ramp up time to have a diverse people is a bit higher. Because you may not suddenly feel that belonging, that you natural feel. So if you can take one step, you can take ten steps further and we can jointly work together. Okay, yeah. So we are at the end of our time slot. Um, but we're all here at the conference. Um, a lot of us will be in the project pavilion. Um, and uh, you're welcome to come by with other <coughs> questions or ideas or things that your project needs help with from the CNCF. Because um, one of the other things we do for people is, is help connect them with like CNCF staff and stuff for other resources. Um, and thank you very much for coming.